can make about half a million different proteins from only about 20,000 genes. How does it work? Alternative splicing. It's kind of like if a chef has a recipe for a chocolate vanilla strawberry cake and they can leave out different steps in that recipe, different parts, in order to make, say, just a chocolate cake, or just a vanilla cake, or just a strawberry cake, or maybe a chocolate vanilla or a chocolate strawberry. Similarly, the instructions for making proteins, so genes, they're basically broken up into different parts, different steps in the recipe that can be pieced together in different ways. These different parts that actually have its instructions for like expressing or making a protein, we call these exons. And these expressed exons get included, well at least some of them, they can be included or not included, and then they're broken up by regions called introns. And these interrupting introns contain regulatory information that lets the cells know when to include which exons and when to skip over certain exons and things like this. This allows our cells to save a bunch of space, um, but even though we have all this kind of like stuff that was thought to be junk DNA in between all those parts that actually have the instructions for making proteins, this regulatory information is really critical. And even having all of that regulatory information, you're still saving space because you can use the same gene to make multiple different proteins. And so this is how our cells can get away with only about six billion base pairs of DNA, so six like letters. Um, and still make all these proteins. And so today I want to tell you about how cool alternative splicing is, as well as how it can sometimes be uncool because mutations in those regions of like the regulatory regions, those introns, can actually lead to differences in splicing that can cause disease. Um, and, but it can also be taken advantage of in order using drugs to kind of change the slicing patterns in order to treat some diseases. So let's talk about alternative splicing. I'm gonna explain a lot of the background in terms of a fun bakery analogy, but just so we're on the same page about the types of things that we're actually talking about. When we're talking about those cookies and cakes, we're talking about different proteins and different splice isoforms or splice variants of proteins. And so basically, just like you can't make a cookie out of a cheesecake recipe, you can't make a totally different protein, like a totally wildly, crazily different protein from, from the same recipe. What we're typically talking about is more like removing parts that tell it to go, adding or removing parts that tell it to, say, go to the nucleus or to get secreted from the cell. And so you can have these minor differences, maybe differences in what they're going to you remove a binding site for a various partner. And so this can affect how the protein functions. Often these different isoforms are, ex you express different isoforms, so the cells make different isoforms in different types of cells. An example of this is trop tropomycin. Um, and so tropomycin is a muscle that's involved, or it's a protein that's involved in muscle movement. And if you look it up on Uniprot, um, so this is kind of like the go-to place when you want to know about a protein, you can see that if you go to sequence and isoforms, there are 10 isoforms produced by alternative splicing, that process we're gonna talk about. It also says additional isoforms seem to exist. So sometimes they're like computationally predicted ones or there's ones where there's some data, but it's not super strong. Typically there's one that's going to be chosen as the canonical sequence, which is often the one that's made the most, but not always. And then it compares the other ones to it. Now I'm guessing based on the name of this, that this isoform is made in skeletal muscle and this one in smooth muscle, this one in fibroblasts. And so you can see different versions of this protein are made in different tissues. And you can also see how they differ, um, including or excluding different exons. If you want to actually see what, what's getting included or excluded, if you go to ensemble, you can see, if you go to the look up the G name, you can then see all of these different alternative splice products. And so some of these are going to be functional, but some of these are going to have problems like retaining an intron and again, or like causing nonsense mediated decay. So something we'll talk about where there's like an early stop sign. Um, so not all of these are going to be functional, but some of these are going to be functional. Um, and yeah, so you can look all of this up when you look in Ensemble and look in Uniprot. But now let's get back to the fun bakery stuff, and then we'll get back to more serious stuff. Okay, so let's open up that bakery. So every good bakery has recipes and it has cookbooks full of these recipes. 
And every one of our cells is a really great um, bakery for making proteins. And so they have cookbooks with recipes for making these proteins. And so in the instructions for making proteins are written in a permanent form, like in a, the original copy. So the original copy of that recipe is written in DNA in the form of a gene. And so a gene is just a stretch of DNA. And these genes, basically all of these recipes are collected up into these sort of chromosomal cookbooks. And so you have 23 pairs of chromosomes and each of these contains lots and lots of coiled up DNA. And that DNA is going to contain various genes. And that those genes are then going to contain the introns and the exons. So the exons, the parts for making proteins, and the introns, the regulatory information in between those parts. So you want to you have that regulatory information that's really important in the nucleus for telling the nucleus when to make a copy of the recipe. Because that's how you get the cells to make a protein from the recipe is you have to make a messenger RNA copy. Just like you wouldn't want to let out that original copy of your recipe from like the restricted section of your of a library, you don't want to let the original DNA copy of your protein recipe out from the membrane bound compartment in your cells called the nucleus. So you have this membrane bound compartment, the nucleus, and inside of the nucleus, you have all these chromosomes. And inside the chromosomes, you have those genes. And then these genes are what we're talking about that are getting alternatively processed after they get made into a messenger RNA copy. So inside of the nucleus, you have transcription, which is the process where you make an RNA copy of the DNA gene. And then this, in order to actually get out of the nucleus and into the cytoplasm where the chefs are, where the ribosomes are, the protein making machinery, in order to get out, it actually has to get processed. So they need to make sure that you remove those introns um, remove the regulatory information that was important for the nucleus, but the ribosomes would get really confused by because that doesn't have protein making um, instructions. Well, we got to remove that. And so inside of the nucleus, you get this process of splicing. And in this process of splicing, you're going to remove those introns. And as we'll talk about, you can remove them in different ways. Um, and so you can remove them, say, by actually cutting leaving out a whole exon in between, like skipping over one, or you can alternatively splice. It, all of this is going to depend on which of these sites that you choose, which of the splicing sites that you choose, and which splice site is chosen is going to depend on different things, including cis acting factors. So when we talk about cis, this is like same. And so this would be things on the same, like on the same mRNA. So this in this case, you can have like RNA sequences in the intron that make it so that it maybe it folds up a little in a way that makes it more or less um, visible to the splicing factors. Um, you can also have trans acting factors. So there are like proteins that act as splicing modulators that can kind of come and enhance or like promote the use of a splice site or make it so that that splice site is less visible and so the splices don't kind of skips over it. And in these different ways you're able to make um, different protein isoforms, different isoforms. So basically iso is similar. So these are similar versions of the same protein. They may be really, really similar, maybe only differing a tiny little amount, or they could be really, really different. Um, and so, but these would be different splicing isoforms. Additional processing also takes place in the, um, in the nucleus. So that messenger RNA, it also gets like a cap um, so a 5-methylguanosine um, cap and then a 3-prime poly A tail. And this is kind of going to give it permission to leave the nucleus. And it's also going to serve as like a launch pad for various um, protein making like helper things that are going to help the ribosome get started and keep going. Now we'd also, although most of the regulatory information gets removed, there's also like a five prime untranslated region and a three prime untranslated region. So translation is the process in which the ribosome is going to travel along that messenger RNA and piece together the amino acids it tells it to in order to make a protein. And so this, the exons are going to be translated, they're going to be expressed, but there's also going to be untranslated regions that are still included. Um, so they're still included in the messenger RNA, even though they're regulatory regions but these are going to be before the start signal and after the stop signal. So these we call the UTRs or the untranslated regions.
but you do not leave in those introns. And so you can splice them out in different ways to get different things, but you got to splice them out or else the cells are going to recognize that the mRNA is defective. They might not even let it out of the nucleus or they might degrade it once it gets into the cytoplasm. So alternative splicing is really, really cool. And we can make a lot of different products from the same gene. We can make even more different things if we actually duplicate the gene, because then we don't have to worry about messing up the original copy. And so what can happen is in the course of evolution, a whole gene is going to get duplicated. So then you have two copies of that in your cookbook. And then random mutations can happen in one of the copies that makes it so that these exons can get, say, duplicated, or they can get combined from different genes. And so this is another cool thing about having that whole exon intron system is that different exons can combine in this process of exon shuffling. And this is happening in the DNA version, so it's long lasting. And because you're working with like a copy, um, then you don't have to worry about um, messing up your original because some of these things um, don't work out so well. But that's where natural selection will then um, disfavor the, the keeping of those, of those products. So some organisms have played around a lot with like gene duplication and things like this. Others use um, more spicing variants than others. And there's vast differences in the number of like DNA base pairs. So how much DNA an organism has and the actual number of proteins that they make, the actual number of like protein coding genes, as well as the actual number of proteins. So like including all of those various isoforms. So the lungfish, the marbled lungfish, Protopterus ethiopicus, has about 40 times more DNA than we do. So it's got about 132.8 billion base pairs versus our just like measly 3 billion. And note that these numbers are in terms of a haploid copy. So basically you have one copy of each, you have two copies of each chromosome and haploid refers to just one of each. Um, so in terms of total DNA, you've got about 6 billion base pairs, um, like 6.4 or so. Um, and by base pairs, we're just talking about, we talk in terms of base pairs. So bases would be like each of the different, different nucleotides in the sequence. And a base pair is because your DNA is double stranded, but these strands are basically templates for one another. So you don't, each of them has the same information. You don't have any different information on the different strands. And so we can say we have about 6.2, um, 6.4 billion base pairs. So, um, and yeah, if we talk about both copies, but anyway, so you can tell that this long fish has a lot more DNA. Um, and, but it doesn't have the most um, protein coding genes. That award is won by the parasite Trichomonas vaginalis. Um, and it has about 60,000 protein coding genes, but it only has about 160 million base pairs. So we we're talking billions here, and now we're talking millions. Crazy, right? Um, and humans only have about um, have 20,000 protein coding genes, but we have way more DNA than this. Than this. So you can see that parasites um, and viruses and things like this often make really compact use of their DNA or their RNA in the case of some viruses. If you want more fun facts about the protein coding genes for various species, this is where I got the information. And you can see for various species that there's really a dramatic differences in terms of the size of the genome and the number of protein coding genes. And this is talking in terms of protein coding genes because, as I mentioned before, there are some genes that make like functional RNAs. So they make RNAs that instead of just serving as an intermediary between the gene and the protein, they actually work as RNAs. So speaking of RNA playing a key role, the int those introns, those regions that we removed from the protein coding um, from our gene to make splice together those exons, and how we talk about the exons being those like really important parts, well, the introns matter too. And these introns, one of the rays that we talked about before was that these introns can kind of make it so that different splice, they can alter which splice site gets used or affect which splice sites get used. And so if you have mutations in those introns, in those regions at those like splice junk, those splice parts where there's normally going to be the spliceosome is going to cut them out and maybe now it doesn't cut them out. Well, in this case, now what you're going to have is you could actually have intron inclusion. And so you're going to have gibberish in, this, in the middle of your protein making protein 
Um, and so that you would have protein parts and then this part, which like that's just as the regulatory information for the nucleus that was never meant to make it out to the ribosomal chefs. And so they're not going to know what to do with it. And they're going to do what they normally, like, the only thing they can do is they don't know what they, they're actually making. They just know like the sequence. And so this says, okay, add an alanine, alicerine, add a valine or whatever it is. Um, this is basically just these different amino acids. And so it's not going to know that that's like wrong. It's just going to add them. And then you get this messed up protein when you get this intron inclusion. You can also have it so that there are new added splice sites like um, that occur in the center of an exon that causes it to skip like a partial exon. Or you could have it so that the exon is skipped altogether when it would normally be included because you've introduced a site that makes it so it kind of like hides that splice site. Um, and I should also note that sometimes these mutations can actually cause what we call nonsense. Um, these can cause like frame shift mutations if it's not a multiple of three. That's when you cause like really dramatic changes because each of the amino acids is specified by a codon, which is the three letters. And so if you don't have a multiple of three, well, now you're going to basically shift the reading frame. And so much more on this in other posts, but it makes it so that everything after that mutation is basically gibberish. It can also introduce a stop, uh, like an early stop sign. Um, so the stop signal for different for um, for making a protein is a, a stop codon, and normally this is at the just at the end of the just at the end of the um, of the transcript. But if this what can happen is that if you get a mutation that it introduces an early um, stop sign, then what can actually happen is that the process of nonsense media decay relies on the, the action of the spliceosome in order to know that something went wrong. So normally when splicing, so when splicing happens, the um, spliceosome, it leaves behind evidence of the splicing in the form of these, these exon junction complexes. But if there was a mistake and now there's a premature stop codon, so if you have one of those nonsense mutations that introduces the stop codon, What's going to happen is that if this is upstream of the exon, this is going to be upstream of that, if that is upstream of that exon junction complex, what's going to happen is that this is going to be left here. So normally when the ribosome goes over, goes along that first strand, like the first time it goes through to make the protein, it's going to push off all of these EJCs, those exon junction complexes. But if it reaches a premature termination codon, it's going to stop before then. But if there's an exon junction complex still left downstream, what's going to happen is that it can actually kind of recruit things that are going to say, like, that are going to kind of tell the cell, like, something is wrong here. Don't just terminate it. Like, get rid of this RNA. And then there are, there are um, a process called nonsense media decay that can then remove that um, mRNA. But you can see that this splicing process is going to come into play here. Um, it's kind of helping out. But splicing isn't always helpful or useful, or if it's done wrong, then you can get diseases. And so in the case of cystic fibrosis, as well as some other genetic diseases, there can be mutations that cause um, the splicing to get messed up. And basically, this mutations can make it so that there's like a site that gets used as a splice site, or there's a site that gets ignored as a splice site. And in order to kind of like help the cells know where they should be splicing, there you can use these drugs is um, called spice switching antisense oligonucleotides, um, or SSASOs, I guess. It, um, or ASOs um, are antisense oligonucleotides, and in this case, they're serving as splice switching. So basically an antisense oligonucleotide is going to be a sequence that's going to bind to RNA or DNA. Um, it's gonna be the complementary. So it's just how we talked about, you have like one strand of DNA that makes a template for the other strand. Well, it can also make a template for RNA and you can get RNA binding to RNA and you can get DNA binding to RNA and you can get these oligonucleotides binding to RNA. Um, so nucleotides, these are basically going, they're typically altered modified versions of DNA or RNA that are going to be more stable. And you can design these to match the region where there's a mutation. And this can like hide the mutation or it can make things more obvious for the cells. It can recruit splicing factors if that's what you want to do. And this is the case in spinal muscular atrophy with the drug Spinraza or Nusinersen. 
Um, so this is an antisense oligonucleotide, like one of those things that we were talking about. So you can see it's got these chemical modifications to make it more stable. And why we need to get, we want it to be stable is because we're going to stick it into cells. We're going to stick it into people and we're actually going to make it so that their cells know how to splice the splice a backup copy of a normal copy that's mutated. So let me step back a sec. So spinal muscular atrophy is a genetic um, disease that ca that's caused by mutations in the gene SMN1. With this SMN1 gene, um, it has a kind of one of those duplicates like we were talking about before. But this duplicate version, SMN2, it's non-functional typically because it's it's basically skips an exon that it needs. It skips this exon seven, and then it makes this unstable protein that gets degraded. But if you could get these cells to include the exon seven, well, now it would make a protein just like SMN1. So drugs like Spinraza and um, Sinusinersin and Recidiplam, they're going to make it more likely that those cells are going to include the exon seven. And how they're going to do this is basically what they do is they bind to a site and where there's normally a splicing repressor bound. And so there's this intronic splicing silencer, which is the sequence here that kind of hides the splice site. And there's a splicing repressor protein that can actually bind there, but it can't bind there if it can't find it and if there's something blocking it. And so Spinraza is able to block that um, splice site and this is going, this, I'm sorry, it's able to block the silencing repressor. And so it's going to make this splice site visible to the spliceosome. And now the spliceosome is going to go in. It's going to basically cut out the intron and it's going to include exon seven. And when it includes exon seven, well, now you get this functional SMN2 protein that can compensate for the loss of SMN1. Um, so yeah, so cool story um, involves Adrian Craner, who was actually, he's a professor at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and I actually rotated in his laboratory. It was like one of my first rotations. So that's the basics of splicing and alternative splicing, how our cells are able to make lots of different versions of a protein based on the single original recipe. And it, this can allow it to do things like ex make different versions of the of a protein and different cell types that interact with different partners or that are localized to different regions of the cell. So maybe they get secreted outside of the cell or maybe they go to the nucleus. Um, so these different splice isoforms can allow for more functions from the same amount of genetic information. The splicing is going to rely where it happens, how it happens is going to rely on both cis acting factors, so sequences in the, in the RNA so sequences that that the splice site, the spliceosome, the splicing machinery can recognize and cut, as well as transacting factors. So like proteins that can come and bind to various regulatory um, sequences in the messenger RNA. And we can modify which splice sites get used using um, using antisense oligonucleotides. And so this is a strategy that's being used to treat some diseases um, and is in like development for multiple others. One more place this comes into play is when you're trying to do some sort of cloning. So basically stick the genetic instructions for making a protein. So into cells and get those cells to say, make the protein for you. Well, what happens is that you don't want to stick in that original gene because the gene, remember it has all the introns in there. And so the bacteria wouldn't know what to do with those introns. Um, and even if they did have the spliceosome and all that stuff, they wouldn't know how to splice it correctly. And so what you do is you want to stick in a DNA version of the RNA, um, of the mature messenger RNA, so that process version that you want, and we call this the complementary DNA or the cDNA. And we can stick in different cDNAs to get different splice variants of the same gene, or we can stick in cDNAs from completely different genes to get completely different proteins. Um, but just always make sure that you know what sort of what DNA you're working with and that you have the isoform that you want. And I'm planning to do a post with more information on this. But hope that helped you understand alternative splicing and splicing.